On this episode of Bootstrappers, we're going to speak with Brad Larson of RentWorks Property Management Company in San Antonio, Texas, about how he has structured his property management company for success. That's next on Bootstrappers. Welcome to Bootstrappers, a unique program designed to help make your business better. From property management to remote workers, Bootstrappers is here to help your business succeed. Bootstrappers is a production of Anaquim LLC. So let's lace up those business boots and join Bootstrappers bootstrappers with Jeremy and Gwen Aspen. Welcome to this episode of Bootstrappers. I'm your host, Gwen Aspen, with my spouse, Jeremy Aspen. Me! And we have a super exciting show today. Uh, We're going to talk about company structure at property management companies. We've got an amazing guest, Brad Larson of RentWorks in San Antonio, Texas. We all know Brad because he is the chief mastermind of uh, Property Management Mastermind Show, um, which is a podcast. And he also is a founder of the awesome, and I can say that because I've been there, Property Management Conference, the Property Management Mastermind Conference. We're going to get more details on that later today. And just a reminder about bootstraps, bootstraps, <laughs> bootstrappers. We are a show where we talk about topics that matter to real estate and property management entrepreneurs. And um, Jeremy, you want to give a little plug to yeah, uh, our sponsor? Amazing, Brad. <laughs> Is amazing. Did, we didn't go a little overboard on that. <laughs> Just kidding. He is. So yeah, um, he's, he knows everything about the industry. That's for sure. I know sure. it. Uh, so this episode, of course, is underwritten by Anaquim. It's powered by Anaquim, and uh, we help to transform and scale your property management business to the objective being to improve profitability. We can do that many different ways. One of them is with the virtual assistant, something we call remote professionals. Uh, the 24-hour hotline for rent manager uh, clients, maintenance management, leasing, or full-blown back office support. You pick it, we'll do it. And that if should be you, our tagline. You pick it, we'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> if you are a fan of the show, share with your friends, like and subscribe on YouTube, um, and leave us a nice message and a review on Apple Podcasts. We love the feedback. We will send a book to the most insightful review on Apple Podcasts after the show. Stay tuned till the end to learn more about our book giveaway. So uh, I would like to just talk, say hello to Brad. How are you doing this morning? Mr. Amazing. Yeah. Hey guys, thanks for having me on. So uh, that's pretty funny that introduction there, Gwen, because you know it sounds like you're you're talking me up there. Like I actually know what I'm talking, know, know what I'm talking about, know what I'm doing. It's really just a compilation of, of past screw ups that have gotten me to this point. Hey, well, man, isn't we that got, for all of us? Yeah. That's for all of us. We just uh, what do they call it? Failing forward. <laughs> Yeah, and how many of us went to a uh, four-year school for property management? I mean, they, we didn't get formally trained. We just That's learned so how to do true. business. That's so true. There and, really isn't like it. a four-year property management school. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Brad. Yeah, let's let's hit it. So uh, I am the uh, founder and owner of RentWorks Property Management Company here in San Antonio, Texas. We manage roughly about 925 single-family homes and growing. We hope to surpass the 1,000-unit mark this year. Uh, things have been going well in the business. It's, it's become extremely uh, well running and profitable here recently because of all the different things that we've gone through with the company structure and changes and et cetera like that. I've also had enough time to devote to creating the Property Management Mastermind. I, I do a podcast show and we have a very uh, large following on the Property Management Mastermind Facebook group. Uh, and so we've also, as you mentioned, we branched into creating a conference called the Property Management Mastermind Conference. Uh, and that's going to be happening here this May 2021. I just signed a contract today for the Gaylord in Dallas, Texas for the venue. Uh, so we are very excited to put on a killer conference. But what we want to talk about today, and I, yeah, I know you guys are going to host this and run it, but I'm excited to talk about the company structure stuff just because I've done so much research and I've changed so many times. Uh, I feel like I have some pretty good background of real world applications to this scenario because it's the chicken and egg argument, right? Which comes first? And then you also have like, there's no right way to do this. 
And so it's it's going to be a fun topic. I'm looking to get more into it. I, I, I'm excited about it, especially because, you know, you and I have known each other for years now, and, and we've seen each other at different phases of our careers, and we've gone through different, in, entirely different structures. And we, I don't know how many conferences I've answered that question of what's the structure, what's the best structure for your business? And like you just said, yours. I mean, what, I mean, there there are different models, and yet we can talk about the different models. But at the end of the day, it kind of depends on personality, depends on the size, it depends on who you have working for you. And I do want to say each structure has positives and drawbacks. Like you know, operations and sales. That we always have that quintessential divide between sell, selling more and then operations getting mad because we oversold. I mean, there are always those silo issues. And so it's just a matter, it's kind of a an art at the same time as it is a science. Would you agree? 100% agreed. And so uh, I'll, I'm going to quote Bob Walters, who was basically a giant in the property management industry in Australia, who has been t- typically 10 years ahead of the U.S. in a lot of their operations for a lot of different reasons. But he says on stage and he says in all the different presentations they put on and all the different conferences that there is no one right way to structure a company. There is nothing that says you have to do it this way, you have to do it right that way. There's no one right way. And Jeremy, you just said it best. It really kind of depends on you. And it kind of de- and, and I'm gonna think we can break this down even to something even more tangible for the listeners. Is it really depends on the personnel and the size of what you have to manage or operate as a business. Because when personnel tend to phase in, phase out, you might design a structure around them more than designing a structure and then put people in that structure. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and that, that's why it's changed so many times throughout the years for me as a startup. You know, I started this thing in uh, my garage, basically, and you built it from zero homes under management uh, eight, nine, ten years ago to, to this point. I've gone through, so I don't know how many, how many changes I've gone through, and it seems to be spurred by big events like somebody's leaving or we have a strategic initiative to say, okay, we have to hire one more uh, big personnel person this year, uh, or somebody leaves, right? And mm-hmm. then you're like, oh crap, now what? And so that tends to be the triggers on on finding the right structure for your company at that time. Or I'd even mention or throw out there, you have an opportunity for a great big client, but you don't have the personnel to do it. So now you've got to bring somebody on that maybe you don't need a full-time person. You need a part-time person. Do you hire them in the United States? And now in, in our industry, do you hire them in, do you hire them overseas? But this is a long overdue conversation. This it is. is a I convers- don't think people have been talking about this enough and I get tons of questions on All it. All the time. And so I do want to just dig in, Brad, tell us now, you said you have 950 units 925. at your, 925 so at 920 yeah. 925 units yeah. what currently is your structure so that's a good point i would call it the let's call it the pod squad or team structure and so i want to give you some background and this ties into perfectly with what you guys are talking about with remote team members uh simply because it was born out of need and so let's let's back up a little bit i mean the last five six seven years we've gone from me doing everything to a portfolio model, to a hybrid model, to back to a commission portfolio management model. Uh, and now we've gone into a system to where we have a team scenario. And so the structure of that is roughly, you have one in, state, in the state's portfolio manager in my office in San Antonio, they roughly manage 450 some homes. And then below them, we have three remote team members a owner facing remote team member, a tenant facing remote team member, and then a, a maintenance team member that's focusing just on maintenance. Now, you can argue you can beef up that by one or two more people per each. It depends on how large you want to go. And th- I got a couple things to say, and I don't want to steal all your thunder when you start asking questions, but it really goes back to it. I got to tell the story because, uh, you know, we're sitting in the, in the brand new COVID world in April, right? and everybody's screaming at me that they want to work from home yet i'm overpaying for several dirtbag property managers that are employed by me and i really have a lot of disdain for them now because they they were very uh demanding entirely overpaid and when they ended up leaving we were all celebrating right because we had two portfolio managers that kind of left in the same time frame 
And so we, as a company at Roundworks, came together and said, all right, heck with it. We're going to create a system to where we use a lot of remote team members. And we basically try to do what you guys have done. And I modeled this after what y'all did there uh, at, at Wistar in Omaha, is you have one big, large portfolio manager, property manager in your office, in the marketplace itself, and then a lot of help behind the scenes with remote team members. That's what we created. And so we created one in, in-house portfolio manager, property manager, and then they have three, four remote team members in the background. This is the coolest part, okay? This, this is a point to the story. A year ago, year and a half ago, if a portfolio manager or property manager left, we were crapping ourselves. We were freaking out. We yeah. were like, oh my God, totally. the world's yeah. gonna end. You know, we were flipping out, right? We, it caused everybody a huge heartache. Now, we just had, I mean, seriously, I told you I was gonna have a story. We had a portfolio manager leave us last week. It was a, it was, broke my heart. I ended on good terms with, with that portfolio manager. I mentioned to that person that if they ever want to come back, they're welcome. But they ended up going to a competitor because of a salary and, and different things. I, you know, there's there's some, some history there. But uh, I was sad to see that person go. When that person left, all of us said, no problem. We got it. My, my leader, Melanie Thomas, said, shouldn't be a problem because the remote team members can cover down on everything that that person was doing until we find the appropriate right replacement. And so our stress level was like, it went from a year and a half ago, two years ago to like a thousand percent stress level down to like, okay, we handle a 10% stress level now. Uh, we deal with a little bit of the fallout and then we can put that replacement person in there and just keep going right on down the road with no, no real traction lost. So we went through something very similar like that. We all, you know, I guess in the property management industry, we go through that sort of stuff. And and Brad, you and I have the scars to show it. Look at these skulls, man. I mean, our hair pulled out for years. If, it, if, we'd, have had, if we'd have known what we know now. You would have a full head of hair? Flush heads of hair. The women would be knocking all over our doors. Oh, as if that's not happening as it, it is. It happens. I just can't. Uh, so I do want to I do want to bring up something though, Brad, um, that I think is really important because you didn't you you had designed a system where you knew before this person gave notice that you would be okay if someone laughed. What that does for a person is you are not held hostage by your employees when you design Huge. your structure where anybody could leave and you know you would survive. It would be okay. It, it uh, allows you to have high standards in a way that you can't have if you know that you're screwed if somebody leaves. And I think that that's really important as people are just thinking about maybe restructuring, uh, they should consider the fact, how do I design this so we're covered if, if somebody leaves and if there's a toxic person in the office, I can say see you later at the moment that they're toxic or when they have to go and it's just, really important don't you think jeremy yeah let, let me give you let me give you some history here sorry to cut you off jeremy about one of the other programs we had years past and i and i took this program called the portfolio management model out of australia i copied it from them and i got to tell you how it didn't work okay because a lot of us we want to incentivize our employees to take on more and so we came up with a solution that every time we handed an employee another home you give them another job to do, they got paid just a little bit more. And so their reaction would be, hey, I'm gonna give you 10 more properties to manage. They'll be like, yeah, yeah, let's go, give me 10 more. They they realized that they just made a little bit more every month because of that. That quickly grew out of hand. And then when one person would leave, we'd have to dump 50 or 100 new Mm. homes onto an existing person and their income all of a sudden without any effort of their own their income suddenly shot up mm. and it created a very it created a disparity on the compensation to where you're getting six month year long rookies in your company getting paid six figures yeah mm. and all of that stuff was just handed to them by other personnel leaving so that oh, model yeah. quickly we quickly grew out of that model to say okay this is ridiculous we're not <laughs> we don't need to be paying this person this giant amount when they didn't do a thing to bring in that business. It was all the business development team and all the company structure itself. And so I'm, I'm telling you that story because 
it sounds great in theory. Okay, one person does everything. They handle the, the leasing, they handle the maintenance, they handle you know the, the business development, some of that stuff, and they handle all the operations and maintenance. Uh, but then, you know, they leave and that creates a vacuum. As mm. you mentioned earlier, Gwen, that power vacuum puts the owner, puts the company in a weird situation to where it, you just can't replace it. And so we've broken things down into the team level, as we mentioned earlier, and we're seeing that work very, very well. And I got to give it, you know, give it you guys props on this because you came up with it. But then we also started our, our remote team member model working with the folks that you helped us hire. So it really is you were one of the very beginnings of, of making this successful years ago. Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, that was really Jeremy who thought of the idea. <laughs> well, I've, I, you know, like we were talking, I've gone through some models and one where it's an offshoot of exactly what you just explained. And it's where we are right now, where um, we kind of have we have a property manager and they're doing uh, they're actually managing about twelve hundred units. So that sounds stupid, um, but but they are they're managing twelve hundred units. But what they've got um, supporting them are the are the departments and they're actually designed to support the property manager customer service and you've got leasing and oh and what else well you have an app okay so applications processor yeah we have i don't know how many customer service people you have now three or four three or four customer service now this isn't just take a call and transfer it no they have to solve 80 percent of calls that come in We also have a quality assurance manager who listens to a call, a a random call of each of those individuals every day to make sure the face of our company is something that we like. So that's something that people run into trouble with. I see it all the time. They hire remote staff or their staff is working remote because of COVID and they're not watching what these calls sound like. They're not managing the outcome and these people really are the face of the company so i think that that's really important to put some of those management practices in place if you're going to give people who are remote um, a lot of longitude and not a ton of oversight Um, and then we have the maintenance maintenance coordinator um, and then we have the property manager who manages the relationships with the with the owner, but they also have accounting working for them, right? Yeah. Oh, and that's the other one. I was mean. Yep, accounting. So the doing the data entry, making sure the bills are done, approval, um, those sorts of things. So it's exactly the model you're talking about, except the teams are expanded a little bit, and they've it, and they've become more uh, support units for for the property management. And then in addition to that, we have a marketing person, and then we have the operate the person really running the day-to-day operation is that yeah, is that so, pretty much it and so it's left the the property manager to do really high level stuff um, and i'll say that this was an accidental uh 1200 units uh, assigned to one person because we had it at 600 and, and a basic model more closely related to the one that you had just mentioned but then the one person left and my my cfo uh, my coo said that no nah, he thinks he can rearrange a couple of things and make this work and i'll say we're only about a year into it not even maybe 10 months into it and it's clicking really nicely now i do want to just talk about maintenance super quick quickly is that we have uh, we do all of our maintenance in-house and we have a turnover team and then a handyman service is that right Oh, that's another thing altogether. Yeah. Do you guys do your own your yeah. own uh, in-house maintenance? We use third-party vendors. Right. And so we, we coordinate with remote team members into property mode, and then we do the dispatching from there. What I, I think we've got to touch on, gang, is we've got to go through the why and why we decided to do this. And I think we should touch, obviously, first thing from that is financials. And to me, there's two levels of financials. you got the company-level financials, but then we break it down into each person and that will answer that big question of why we want to go through this and setting up a system to where we can use remote team members. So in the old way, you guys remember this, you know, from all of our experience in the property management industry or any any sort of uh, service-based industry, your most expensive thing is your personnel. And so that would typically, if you were doing good, right, this is from analysis of many, many different companies in our space. If you're doing good, you're south of 50% of your revenue 
going towards your personnel, going towards your staffing. Right. 50%. That was like a good figure back when. So now I think that can be shaved down to if you're north of 40%, I think you're hurting. I think you're missing the boat. And so I got to go deeper into this. So you guys will tell this to people all the time, but you know, it's much better coming from somebody who's actually doing it. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to sell anybody anything other than this is what's working for us is got to understand that the remote team member system literally costs one quarter of what it would cost you to hire somebody here in the States. And so if you take that into account, that means you can add two or three or four more people and still have the same amount of accounting expense, staffing expense that you did before. And so are you able to provide a better customer service with three people versus one? Well, the absolute answer is of course, you can, you can provide a much better service. And that's why we did it. So we were able to control the costs, shave the expenses down and create a better model for better servicing our customers and clients and that's the big reason why. And, I, and again, if you could make 10% more in your business, wouldn't you want to? And wouldn't you want to control your own destiny? Don't you want to get away from these intrusive employment laws here in the States that just burden business owners? I mean, right. all the above. Right. So now are you using the NARPM chart of accounts and that the financial he, metrics? He was the wizard that started it. That's what I thought. <laughs> So I was the jerk that raised my hand in front of Narcom and said, we need this. Right. And they graciously agreed. And we, we uh, I was the head of that, that committee. I was chair of the committee. And so we hired uh, an entity and they created the Narcom accounting standards and we implemented that first thing. So this has been in our business well over a year. And I think it's done, it's just done magical stuff for us. So I will say that any anybody that's watching and if you're not using the NARPM standardized chart of accounts and using their metrics, you really need to. And I, NARPM does not pay us, um, but join NARPM because there are uh, there's a lot of valuable um, um, assets that come from there, but not least of which is the NARPM chart of accounts. And because we'll it gives put a the, link. We'll put a link at okay. the end of the show notes. It gives the ratios that Brad is talking about. That's the DLER, the direct labor um, uh, expense ratio. And that means, well, we don't need to go over what it means. It's basically what you're saying. It should be about 40%. So instead of it being like a 2.0, you're talking more like a 2.2, 2.3. And I, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty detailed. And so forget about all the chart of account stuff. That's cool stuff. And that's really easy to transpose when you get into it. It's the control measures that people, I think, are missing out on. Uh, that's something that hit me pretty, pretty close to home is, you know, Gwen and I were talking about this in pre-show is we had we had a large embezzlement you know oh. years ago and uh, we discovered it in 18 2018 and it kind of motivated me to like okay there was no real guide for me to put into place in a property management world yeah I was a bad business owner yeah I made a bunch of mistakes I trusted one individual way too much and that individual stole a lot of money from my company. Oh. And so we're still in the middle of a civil lawsuit and criminal charges and all this other, other stuff going on. But that motivated me to assist others to potentially adopt the oversight and take one thing from that, trust but verify, okay? Mm -hmm. Consider your uncle's brother, sister's kid doing your accounting. Yeah, you might trust that person because you're related or you're even married to them, but do you trust they never make a mistake? And that's why we say, Go get CPA oversight, go do monthly and quarterly audits, uh, build a system in there that you have checks and balances. Uh, all that is in the, the NARPM accounting standards guideline. So if you just follow that playbook, mm -hmm. it'll walk you through how to implement those types of checks and balances into your accounting system. That's one of the most important things to make sure that you're, you're, you're mistake free and you're doing the right things. Because if you don't, you could basically build and build and build and fall to the wayside and be shut down because you're just not doing the right things. You don't know where the money is. We're money managers, right? That's what we are. Right. That's what we do. Right. Well, that's so helpful. And thank you for sharing your story with that. Um, I do want to also go back to your original question, the why, though. And I want to tell a quick story about Wistar. So when, when Wistar started, we took any piece of garbage with a roof on it, right? Because we just started our company and we were no, you know, not known quantities in the industry and we just that's how we got started. So we had some 
some buildings where people without email addresses, not very high end things in our portfolio. And when we got to the remote, where remote workers were doing everything, it didn't make sense to have all these people inside the office for people to do the walk-in servicing. Um, and so we had to make this crucial decision. Were we willing to give up the low end stuff, which would change the course of our company, and provide a higher level of service through these remote workers where we were expecting people to do the application online, you have to have a credit card, you have to have, um, you know, be able to fill out information on, a, on the internet. Were we going to forego the in-service or the in-person service and just go straight online? And we said yes to that. And we were able to provide that high-end tenant a better experience because we were totally focused on it. So that's part of the why as well. What kind of apartments or houses do you want to um, have in your portfolio? And what kind of service do the people that you are primarily focused on expect from a company like you and owners of those buildings, what do they want? You know, what it really infuriated me to do this, this whole pod team structure was right around the beginning of the whole COVID world. This was uh, March, April, May. Two of my very, uh, they're gone now, but they were, you know, were rather obnoxious type individuals <laughs> that were working from home off and on with us. You know, we'd let them work here, day or there. And they were posting negative things on Facebook. Oh, my employer is so mean. They're making me go to the office today. You know, I have to be home with my kids. I don't know what to do. And they were they were putting this out on a public forum. Jeez. And it just it just incensed me because here we are, uh, we're letting people work from home. We're being very generous. We are a super generous company to work with. And, and, it's, and it just hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm paying this person four times the amount that I should be paying them here in the States to sit at home and work remotely when I could get four of those people for that amount and work from a different location, like Mexico, for example. And that just, just like the trigger. It's like, okay, this is, it's time. All right, so Brad, I know you, especially before we're going to a lot of conferences, you talk to a lot of property management companies. We're talking about the structure of property management companies. Are there any things that you recognize when you're talking to somebody that that is a mistake? Like, what are the biggest mistakes that uh, maybe especially smaller property management companies make when they're trying to uh, uh, get their uh, their feet under them? Oh, several. I mean, a couple of them that come to mind is them trying to do everything, where they're trying to do way too much. They're trying to do business development. They're trying to do operations. They're trying to do this. They're yeah. trying to do that. Great I get you have to in the beginning. Okay, that's the big mistake. You have to figure out exactly where to section off things. So take an example, okay? why are you processing applications right if you are you know a startup or if you are a existing property manager business business owner why are you doing applications have somebody else do those for you that's an easy one why are you uh doing the accounting have somebody else do that for you that's an easy one another big easy mistake that's kind of identifiable is they still give out their mobile phone why oh. are you giving away your personal mobile oh. phone? Oh my God, Brad! Your tenants and your clients. Pet you peeve. Know? Oh my yes. God, say it again. That is so yeah, important. Never, never give out your personal mobile phone. Go to the AT and T, spend fifty bucks a month, and get a different phone. Get or get an a uh, 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 VoIP phone that forwards calls to you when you want them to. Otherwise, let it go into the structure that you have in place for after hours because. Those tenants that you're giving your phone call, your phone number to today, will have your number in two years and five years, and they will call hey, you. And here's the problem: it's also no employees that work for us are allowed to give out their personal cell phone because what will happen is that somebody will have, say, a leak that's horrible, and they call someone's cell phone. That person is on vacation or whatever, and then when it we're trying to figure out who pays what, the tenant says, hey, I paid them, or, or I called them, and the owner's like, oh. they said they called you, and who's on the hook for that $7,000 you know, giant flood? Yep. It's, it's us. Yeah. So under no circumstances is an employee ever allowed to give out their personal cell phone. It has to be routed through our VoIP system, because then every call is recorded, 
And if you have any um, major catastrophes, you want those calls recorded. Additionally, um, you you wanted to say. Well, something? I was just going to say um, <laughs> because years ago we actually had an employee die. Uh, the house had exploded, and she was in it. And one of the questions that came up during the lawsuits that ensued and whatnot is whether or not she had given out her phone number and whether or not the tenant had called to warn or anybody had called to warn. Because if they call that tenant, I'm sorry, that technician, then they are calling an agent of the company. They told the company, and now we're neglecting. Uh, we were neglectful. What's the word I'm looking for? Yeah, no, that's right. Whatever it is. So as just in our industry, there it is a dangerous, it can be a dangerous industry, right? Take the precautions. Make sure that you funnel emergencies through a system that is designed to handle emergencies, not maybe go through a voicemail. Yeah. Well, that's it, an easy one, too, the maintenance call center. I mean, that, that should be a no-brainer for right. any management company is they got to be able to do something like that to at least allow for 24 seven maintenance and put that burden onto somebody else. Another pet peeve, you know, Gwen, you might have something else to add to that is I can't stand seeing companies where they have a startup or they're beginning and they're using Gmail or they're using Yahoo oh, or yeah. Domain. The company owners, Scott Brady, I'm talking to you. Okay. <laughs> you manage thousand plus units, 1500 plus units out in California and he's using a Gmail account. I tease him every day for that. I just saw a company owner here in the local market using a Yahoo account. I'm like, what are you? That's like well, AOL. Come on, that's, that's amateur hour, right? <laughs> yeah. Amateur hour. So grow up, get a Microsoft 365 account, brand it with your company. So it's gonna be Gwen at yourcompany.com. That's how you brand it. And you look like a professional. Look yes. Like what you're doing. Yes. So Brad, okay, so I'm a, let's just pretend I'm a brand new property manager uh, starting my property management company, how many units do you think I should do all by myself before I start outsourcing some of these these uh, tasks? 75. That's, 75 that's units, okay. And so let me give you a background on that. So uh, part of, you know, I was, I was, you know, a prior service in the military and when I got out, they gave us a post 9-11 GI Bill. And that was of course after 9-11, post 9-11. So I went to uh, go get my MBA and this was my entire focus because I was just starting the management company. So I got my MBA focusing it around the property management industry. So I went through this whole entire, you know, cost analysis, expense, income stuff, and it ended up being right around 75 properties. That's when it starts to actually be profitable uh, to where you can pay yourself a living salary and you can start to grow. So you got to do everything up to maybe 50 to 75 properties to really get it going. And then you can start to potentially hire more staff members and taking some of those things off of you. Uh, you know, another good person to ask would be Amy Carnes. Uh, great story, I did a podcast with her and she sold a company here in San Antonio, moved to Dallas and started from scratch. Okay, she started dead from scratch and she built it by herself up to about 50 to 75 homes and then started to slowly hire pieces away from her. And now she's managing 150, you know, from the beach somewhere, right? It, it really does turn into a scenario to where if you segment out all the things that are being done, you can create a business that runs itself. And that's the magical part of what we do is you can create that. You don't have to do everything. You don't have to take the phone calls on a Saturday afternoon. You know, you can build this business to where it can run itself. I'm doing it now. I've done it. And so that's that's what I want to tell people about that side as far as the, the, the property level. So let's just say if you are starting a 250 unit or house property management company right now, who would be on your team? Just name some of the roles that you'd have. Well, we did talk about the application side, okay? Uh, but then you, let, let's say if, if you could build it to where you could manage this mostly from remote team members, you gotta have one person on the ground in your market. Uh, you have to have an inspection resource. That could be a technician, that could be a, a licensed third-party inspector you can hire for cheap. Uh, you have to have somebody to be able to conduct your maintenance and that can all be done third-party remotely. Uh, you have to have somebody to do your accounting. And so that could all be done third party remotely. You can jump into several of the accounting sources that do specific accounting for property managers. I mean, all of the stuff that you do can pretty much be farmed out. And you as the business owner on the ground can do the big stuff. Like maybe you put the home on the market that you want to list and sell for rent. You know, maybe you're doing the business development because I think that's probably one of the most important parts of the business owner in the beginning is to grow. Uh, it, you know, we talked about this earlier, it's a chicken and the egg concept. Well, if you don't have any properties to manage, you don't have any worries, do you? 
So you got to go out. You got to go out and grow the business. You got to go get the business first, and then figure out how to successfully operate under a management system. And you're going to make your mistakes, but you got to have the the homes to manage first. And so you got to build a marketing piece to get the business, and then build slowly as you go all the stuff to make it work well. You can't just do everything at once, right? You just you just can't. And, and, so, and you do need that discipline, right? That's the one thing I've noticed kind of throughout the industry is that uh, people, go to con- people go to conferences all the time and they write down a lot of things that they think will make their company better. And you know what they do with those things? One year later, they, f- they, f- they regret that they didn't do it last year. That, I mean, that's, that's the cycle. If you don't have carve out enough time through some efficiency, and it, like you would mentioned at the beginning, it's a lot harder, but take five minutes a day to make your company better, like to work on the infrastructure so that you can get to a place where you can best uh, manage your own time so you can be better at what you're doing for your clients. And if you well, are- small, small little caveat on yeah. that is the, the implementation factor, right? I'm, I'm a huge, that, that's one of my pet peeves too, is not implementing. They go to these conferences, they take all these good notes and they have these great intentions of doing big stuff when they don't implement. So here's one real world story about this. Scott Brady, again, I was picking on him earlier, but to his credit, he took uh, all of his units that he manages, roughly about a thousand units, you know, between however many managers he has, and they implemented one new fee. And they called it a annual technology fee that is charged the 1st of January every year. And I'm not gonna mention the fee amount, so we're covered, but it was just one annual one-time fee every year for all of the owners and that made him five figures in one failed swoop and so he made the policy change he put it out to his owners and you know how many com- complaints he got he said zero he got zero complaints yeah. from the owners that he managed just for one action because he made it seem like okay this is justifiable this is what the benefits you're getting this is the service we provide and this is what it costs here it is that he was he was he was not afraid to implement that which made him quite a bit to cover providing a very good service yeah and just to get one little it might take even something relatively simple like that you know rolling out a charge it might take a a person two full days of their time to do it but and i guarantee it took let's say 16 hours of his time he made whatever it, the low side ten thousand dollars that year for that time and that's what efficiency does that's what the implementation does taking the advice like that you've brought to the show today stuff that we talk about in the uh, in other shows um those are the things that you have to do something you have to have a disciplined approach at making your company better or guess what entropy kicks in and things start to flail. And all you do is put out fires. Fire, you're a firefighter. You're just a firefighter instead of a, you know, a business entrepreneur. Right. Uh, and you've done, I mean, you've got a property management company, you've got other endeavors, you've been on boards now. Those are, those are all the things that happen to people that have dedicated their time up front to establishing a, a solid structure and, and, and reaping the, the uh, rewards of that time. That's Absolutely. what that's like. I look at it. If, I look at it like if I don't do this one implementation right now, I am losing out every single day I delay. Compound uh, interest. You just, that's you, exactly. You just mentioned it a minute ago to the one person that looked at their goals and they said, "Man, I should have done this, you know, last year or two years ago." Yeah. Well, how much did you lose? Oh. Exactly. The time you did it from the time you first heard about. It, how much did you lose? And, that's what keeps me up at night. And it's not that we can po- point fingers at everybody and say, oh, you're at fault, you're at fault, you're at fault, you're at fault, because we've all done that. But to your point, and I think this is the best part, one damn thing, take one thing from a conference, implement it. If that, if nobody does anything but that, that will, that will pay for the conference and more. Just one, just one. Have the discipline for one thing. This has been an awesome discussion. Brad, can you just plug um, your conference one more time? What, sure. what, what are so, the dates? You know, yeah, we just signed a contract today, literally with the Gaylord Resort in Grapevine, which is Dallas, Texas. Uh, we did site visits in Dallas, site visits in Vegas, and we ended up making a decision to go with Dallas because of their, they're a lot more open and it's a great venue. And so uh, I think it's gonna be a fantastic event, May 19, 20, and 21 in 2021. So that's a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. The conference really kicks off on Thursday the 20th, Full day conference Thursday, full day conference Friday, ended up with an awards banquet, black tie event Friday evening, 
go to pmmcon.com to learn more. Awesome. And Brad, Podcast. I know you're a big uh, reader. What is your favorite book right now? I did a podcast the other day about a book called Buy Then Build. And it really has kind of changed the mindset of what I'm looking at. Walker Dival wrote this book and it talks about buying businesses versus creating businesses from scratch. And it could be any business. And, you know, I love the recurring model revenue. Uh, another good one is, is John Warlow's Automatic Customer. I think that's another fantastic book talking about the uh, residual recurring revenue models that property managers, pool companies, uh, HVAC companies, mm. iTunes, you know, all that recurring residual uh, revenue that they get from having that type of a business model. Go out and get those books. I do a lot of audio books because I, I don't read too good, but I can certainly listen. Yeah. And uh, I think that's a really cool book because it just changed the mindset because before I'm like, I, I got to buy more homes. I got to buy more, you know, real estate. But now I'm like, I want to buy more businesses because I can actually control the business, uh, put some of my sweat equity into it and make it go up in, re in value exponentially versus I can't change the real estate market. I can't change the interest rates. You know, I can't, I have no control over that. I have no control of a, you know, tenant decides to go in there and dilapidate a home, but I can really oversee a business and make it uh, improve with all the things you guys talk about here in your show. So how do we get our listeners to go over to your podcast and listen? Yeah, they can check that one out. Uh, they can get into it at the propertymanagerbroker.com. Again, propertymanagerbroker.com. Because, you know, part of what the other businesses that I'm working on is since RentWorks, the property management company, is running itself, I've created a business brokerage to where all we do is help buyers and sellers work on property management companies. So if you're interested in buying or selling a property management company, that's all we do. And I say we as Phil Mazur and myself, who is a virtual CFO for the property management industry, we think that's going to be a pretty neat deal. And it's going to be able to help the industry get more multiples for companies because it's simple, Jeremy. Nobody knows what property management companies are selling. That's so true. Right? Yeah. It, it, nobody knows. Yeah. But if we can start building a history of what we have learned, we can start raising the value of those property management companies to get the owners who want to make a successful exit, we can get them more. And of course that brings more leverage into our entire industry. You guys know that uh, because of the COVID, uh, man, everything is just going to the property management side. People are moving out of the cities, they're looking for single family home rentals like crazy. And it makes the buying and selling of the single family homes that much more valuable. In addition to managing those assets that much more needed. And so you're seeing a lot more uh, interest being generated in what we do as property managers. Well, that's great. I really appreciate all of your wisdom. And if you would like to get a free copy of Brad's favorite book, the most insightful comment on this podcast um, and feedback on Apple Podcasts or YouTube will receive that book. So next week, uh, well, first off, we want to thank you, Brad, so much for your time. Thanks a million, man. Good seeing you again. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we'll see you in May for sure. Awesome. Glad to have you guys. See you at the conference. Oh, by the way, a little a little pitch for Gwen. Uh, I have hired Gwen to be a facilitator at the Property Management Mastermind Conference, and she's going to be speaking on main stage discussing the remote team member model, which I think has changed the industry. And I, I believe she's a subject matter expert in this uh, with the entire faction that you manage there with with what you guys are doing. So I'm excited to have you on main stage, giving a great presentation. Look forward to seeing you there. Oh, of course, cool. I'm so pumped. I can't even tell you. Last time it was a ball. It was the best vacation I had in all 2020. <laughs> That's for sure. And I, think, I can't wait to come back. I think I'm just going to go to that so I can sit out there in the audience and and, and have an excuse to look at her <laughs> you, for the entire you're time. You're way too nice. You're way too nice. Um, so next week on the show, we'll be talking to our star remote professionals, speaking of remote professionals, about best practices, how best to motivate and manage remote employees, and what advice he would have for others working remotely. That's up next on Bootstrappers. This has been Bootstrappers, a unique presentation designed to help you better understand how the world turns. Contact Gwen or Jeremy at posts at bootstrappers.club or visit our website, anaquim.net. Be sure to subscribe to our podcasts on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and our YouTube channel. Thank you and join us next time for Bootstrappers.